Ready to go? So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it's our great pleasure to be again live in person um, at this uh, Farm to Categories for Groups research group meeting. Uh, we are sponsored by the LMS, so very kindly sponsor us to organize these meetings kind of three, three times a year. I've been already sent the details of the next meeting, so we'll just take a couple of minutes to advertise it. It will be on the 23rd of September in London, central London, organized by uh, Brittany Rosinkis. And the topic will be chronological methods in group theory. It will be a little bit on the Brazilian theme because the three speakers are Brazilian, I think. So there is Paula Macedo Lins de Araujo, um, Yuri Santos Vego, and Pavel Zaleski. So the three excellent speakers will be in London the 23rd. Uh, everyone is welcome. There are more details on our website. For today, uh, the usual attendance list for the presence, the elements like to know who is that is attending these meetings. Um, so I will circulate this. And otherwise, we can start with the math. Uh, so today, it's our pleasure to start this meeting with uh, Valentina Gratian from Milano di Carca, who will talk to us about sharpness for fusion system. Thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you for the invitation to be here and uh, present my results today. So uh, today, I'm going to talk about sharpness for fusion systems. And really, the main goal of my talk is to make you understand what this title means. So we'll see briefly what fusion systems are. I know many people in the audience already know it, but I'll go through it. Then I'll tell you what we mean by sharpness for fusion systems. And at the end, I'll give you I state a conjecture regarding sharpness for fusion system and tell you something about what it's known so far concerning this conjecture. Okay, so let's start from some motivation. So the point of working with fusion systems and then sharpness is to be able to study the key local structure of a finite group. Now, given a finite group G, P local subgroup of G is any subgroup of the form normalizer in G of P, where P is any P subgroup, P is any product. So to study the P local structure of G means to study the structure of the subgroups of G of this form, of this shape, normalizer G. Now it turns out that if you can gain enough information on the P local subgroups, then you can deduce properties of the form group G. And this is the so called P local study the p-local subgroups in order to gain information on the form. And the p-local approach has applications in various areas of mathematics or algebra. Speaking. First of all, group theory. And the most famous example is uh, the theorem of classification of finite simple group. In this theorem, especially for the prime p equal to the study of the two local subgroups plays a crucial role in the proof. Even more, what plays really an important role are the centralizers of involutions. But then again, if you can study the two local subgroups, then you have information on that, and this is what is used to classify finite simple groups. But we can also look at modular representation theory. In there, there are many so-called local to global conjectures that do exactly this. They say, well, if you have a property at the p-local level, then you have this property for the full group. And we can also go to homotopy theory. An example here is the Martino Pretty conjecture, that's now a theorem proved by Martino Pretty and Oliver, that says that two finite groups have the same local structure, even though, if, roughly speaking, their classifying spaces do so. We're going to talk more about Martino Pretty conjecture later on in the talk. This is just to tell you from starting that we have application also in homotopy. So I hope I convinced you that it's interesting to study the p-local structure of a finite group. And the modern way to do that is via the theory of fusion systems. Now, these are settings. So G is a finite group, P is a prime divided by the order of G, X is a silo P subgroup of G. 
And we say that two sum P and Q of S are fused in G if they are conjugated by an element of G. So this is what we mean by fusion of subgroups. And now we want to take all P subgroups of S and try to understand which one are fused by uh, using the action of G by conjugation and also identify this fusion map, so the conjugation. And to do that in a mathematical setting, we use a category. Talk about the fusion category of the final group G on its silo P subgroup S. This is the category whose objects are all subgroups of S. And well, the morphism is what I just said. So the set of morphisms from P to Q in this category, denoted form GPQ, is given by the restriction of conjugations by elements G in G that map P instead of Q. And we restrict them to the group. So this is the set of morphisms in our cup. And now if we replace Q by P, so we consider the morphisms from P itself, we denote this set now all the GP, and this is actually a group composition. That's not part of the C. And also, if you think a moment about it, you want conjugations when applied to P, give you P itself. So the element you're using, the element G you're using, is in the normalizer in G of P. So I think it's not hard to convince yourself that this group, all the GP, is actually isomorphic as a group the portion normalizer in GOP over the centralizer in GOP. Clearly, if you're acting uh, using an element in the centralizer in GOP, your conjugation is just a trivial one. So you need to take this portion. All right, so this last line says that a way to study the P-local subgroups, so the normalizers in GOP, is to study this group of the GP. In other words, to study the fusion category of G on S. I'm going to show you a quick example that clarify things. But let's pick up P group. I chose the prime two and the dihedral group of order A. As you all know, this is the group generated by two elements, A and X. A as order four, X as order two. A conjugated by X is A in the is A in the And now we pick the group G containing <laughs> the A as a silo two subgroup, well, the pick the A itself. And now we look at the fusion map, so conjugations by elements of G, that is the A. Well, these are the black maps you see in this picture. So A is conjugated to A to the three. This is the conjugation by X that you can see here in the definition of the eight. And it's not hard to see that AX is conjugated to A to three X, and X is conjugated, so it's fused to A square X. Now, one in A squared is in the center of the A, so try to conjugate by an element of the eight. We get the trivial. So one is only fused to itself, a square is only fused to itself. And these are all the fusion marks for this category. So this is the fusion category of the atom itself. It's just given by the inner of the morphism of the atom. You can make things a little more interesting. You can now change your group G, take the symmetric group of the group four, the eight embeds in it. For example, set A four cycle, one, two, three, four, X the two cycle, one, three. D8 is still a silo two subgroup of this group. And now let's look at the fusion maps. You still have all the black maps for the conjugations by D8. But now you can pick an element B outside of D8, for instance, the three cycle, one, two, three. And now something new happens. If you apply conjugation by B to the element A squared, you obtain AX. And if you keep conjugating, you get A to the three X and then back to A squared. So we notice two things. The first one is that we have new maps, new fusion maps, the one in orange. The second one is that we are taking an element A squared that's in the center of the A, and we are mapping it outside of the center. This tells you immediately that the conjugation by B is not an automorphism of the A. Indeed, if you try to conjugate by B another element, say X, you'll end up outside of the D8 you are considering but we only care about the maps between subgroups of the A or elements in this example. So we don't care about the conjugation by B applying to all of the A, but only apply to the subgroup that they call E, because when I apply to E, I'm staying inside of the A. 
So you see here the fusion category of S4 on D8 is given by the black maps in and of D8, they are always there, plus these orange maps that together with the black maps that were already there give me actually the full automorphism of this group E, or in general, they give me all the G. Okay, I can keep playing this game. I can change the group G, I can go larger, take A6. I still see the black maps, the orange map. Now I can find an element C that gives me the blue maps. So this time, the fusion category is given by the inner of the eight, automorphous group of E, and automorphous group of E. So going back from the beginning of the story, we started from the same P group, the same two group, V8, and we saw three different ways of fusing elements inside of it, depending on the group G we were picking. And if you want to have fun with it, you can prove that these are actually all possibilities for V8. Whatever group G you pick, containing V8 as a seal of two subgroups, you'll end up with one of these three possibilities. You cannot have more. It's not hard to convince yourself about this. The point is that one can look at the problem of the P-local structure, forgetting about G and just focusing on the P-group. So let's say you choose your favorite P-group, G8, and you ask yourself, in how many different ways can I fuse elements or subgroups inside of it without knowing in advance what the group G would be? But that's the, the spirit, the philosophy behind the definition of a fusion system. So we don't have the group G anymore, we just have the P group, S, and we try to describe the fusion groups. The so fusion system, F on S, is a category whose objects, as before, <coughs> all the subgroups of S. And now how do we, can we describe the morphisms? We cannot talk about conjugations because we don't have G. So we say that the morphisms from P to Q, where they are homomorphisms of groups that are injected, because conjugations are injected, then we want to include all conjugation maps by elements of S. We do have S, can talk about conjugation by S, and we want them to be there. The black maps in the example, they were always there. And then we have a technical requirement. So every morphism is a composition of an isomorphism and an inclusion. This just makes sure that if you have a fusion map, you also have the inverse fusion map in your category. You can, you can do restriction in, a, in an obvious way. So, all properties that conjugations have, you want to have them in this more general set. Moreover, when we talk about fusion category of a group, I told you that I wanted my S to be a silo P sub. I could have given the definition with S any P group, but I wanted a silo P sub because in this scenario, we have very nice properties. And we want to keep the nice properties in the general setting. So we are adding some axioms. And when we have these extra axioms, we talk about saturated fusion system. So from now on, whenever I say fusion system, I really mean saturated fusion system. And these are the guys people are interested in. And clearly, um, if G is a finite group and S is a silo, P subgroup of G, then the fusion category of G and S is a saturated fusion system. Because that's how we construct a saturated fusion system, just extend it. Somehow of this fusion The interesting thing is that sometimes you start from a P group, you build your fusion system, so you choose collection of morphisms that satisfy all the requirements that even satisfy saturation. So if you have a saturated fusion system on your on a P group, but there is no finite group G containing your P group as a silo and realizing the fusion by conjugation. So when this is the case, when you cannot describe your saturated fusion system as the fusion category of finite group, then you say that your fusion system is exotic. And the appearance of exotic fusion system was surprising at first, because people were just trying to describe a general setting to basically study the action of conjugation of a finite group on its subgroups. And everything worked fine, but then these exotic objects appeared. So I'm going to give you some examples of known family of exotic fusions. First of all, well, the prime is two, we are lucky. There is only one known family of exotic fusion system, that's an infinite one, it's called 
uh, benzyl solo so fusion systems. And there's a conjecture that says that that's about it. There are no other exotic fusion systems when the prime is two. And that's very good because if you remember, I told you that the prime two is important if we want to work on the classification of finite simple groups. So it's important that these exotic fusion systems don't create problems in that setting. So this is good, and this is what seems to say that there is a good chance to give an alternative proof of that theorem using fusion systems, and that's <laughs> a fact of problem. So P equal to everything looks good. But now, if we move to odd primes, the situation is chaotic. It's not well understood. There are known examples right now, more families that are appearing and have been studied, but it's still not clear why this fusion, these exotic fusion systems appear and how to predict their appearance. And you might think, okay, these exotic fusion systems appear for pathological P groups, maybe very big or with a very weird structure. Well, in 2004, Witz and Birwell constructed not one, but three exotic fusion systems on an extra special group of order seven to the three and exponent seven, this group of menses. A very small group, and they proved that it already affords three exotic fusion systems. And this is an example of a group having a maximal subgroup that is a billion. Oliver with Craven, Semeraro, and Ruiz classified fusion systems on this class of P groups. And in doing that, they uncover many examples of exotic fusion systems. So this is a class of P groups that supports exotic fusion systems. Another class is given by silo seven subgroup of the group G27, or if you prefer the silo seven subgroup of the monster, the same. And Parker and Semeraro classified fusion system on silo P subgroup of G2P, and they found out that there are soft fusion systems when the prime is seven, and they found 27 of them in this group. And again, not a very big group, it has order seven to the six. And just to make sure that from this slide, you don't are tempted to believe that bad things happen only at certain primes, Parker and Strauss constructed an infinite family of exotic fusion systems on P groups of order P to the P minus one, where P is any prime greater or equal than five. So you can find an exotic fusion system for every prime. So it does not depend on certain bad primes. Okay, so these are some examples, and I could say these are uh, the largest examples of the largest classes uh, known so far containing uh, exotic fusion systems. And I'd like you to remember this because they are going to be important toward the end of the talk. So just to recap, we have the benson solomon system for P equal 2, the system on P groups having a maximal subgroup that is abelian, the 7 silo G27, and the Parker strong systems. Okay, that's about it for my introduction to fusion systems. Now, let's try to understand what this word sharpness means. And we need to jump in the world of homotopy. So at the very beginning, in my motivation slide, I mentioned the Martino Pretty conjecture. Now I'm here. I picked up. And as I mentioned already, this says that two finite groups G and H have the same p local structure if their classifying spaces do so. So let me clarify some terms in this set. So a classified space for a discrete group G is a path-connected puzzle space X, such that, this is the important information, G is isomorphic to the fundamental group of X. And then we also require that universal covering space E of X is constructed. Now, all classifying spaces for the same group G, they are homotopy equivalent, and you can pick one that has a precise description and this is what we call BG. So let's just remember that if you have BG, then you have a complete information on G in its fundamental. So that's the important thing here. And now when you talk about the martino pretty conjecture, well, you don't really want to look at the full classified space of G, but you are interested in the P-local structure. And that's where this P-completion of the classifying space comes into the picture. So, this is a space that contains information 
on the P local structure regime. So I'm not giving here a very precise definition. Sorry about that. But just to give you the idea of the picture, you can move from final groups to a most of the theory with this correspondence from final, the P local structure of final groups and then somehow P local structure of classifying spaces. And uh, one way to read this theorem is that one way to have information then on the P local structure of finite groups is to gain information on the classifying space. If we have information on that, then we use this theorem to deduce properties of the finite group. So, how do we do that? How do we gain information about the classifying space of a group? One important tool is the so called homology decomposition. So this is a process of gluing together classifying spaces of a suitable collection C of subgroups of G. In order to obtain a space X that is isomorphic to BG. So the idea is, as for the P local structure, we don't look directly at the group G, we focus on subgroups. Here is the same, we don't stare at BG and try to understand it, we use subgroups. We need to select nice subgroups of G, look at their classified spaces, and then there is this process, the homology decomposition of gluing them together to obtain information on PG. And this gluing comes in the form of a homotopy collision, whatever that means. The point is that this is connected to a so-called bosphil can homology spectral sequence that's something of this sort. So you had an inverse limit computed on the orbit category of this class C of subgroups you picked. So don't worry about the term orbit category, I'll tell you more about it in a moment. And then you have a cohomology function, H to the G. So the point here is, if you can understand this inverse limit, then you can understand your homology decomposition, so you can glue things together in a nice way, so you understand BG, so you understand the P-local structure of G. So if we can compute that, we are happy. And here comes the definition of sharpness. Meyer, in 1998, gave this definition. He said that the homology decomposition is sharp if, when you compute this limit, it vanishes whenever i is greater or equal than 1 and j is greater or equal than 0. So basically, for any j and for almost every i, you are only left with i equals 0 can say that this spectral series sequence collapses on the vertical axis. So I think what you can deduce from this is uh, <laughs> chose, if you can choose a nice collection of subgroups of G that gives you homology, a sharp homology decomposition, then it's easy to compute this limit. You're only left with the I equals zero, and then it's easy to compute BG, that was your initial goal. So whenever we have a sharp decomposition, we have an easier way to compute the classifying space. All right. So now let me tell you a bit more about this OC that you see here, orbit coming. So let's keep here the definition of a sharp homology decomposition. Now, start from your group G, and again, G is finite. The orbit category of G is the category whose objects are all subgroups of G, so absolute. And let's see how I describe the morphism. If you take P and Q subgroups of G, you first consider all the elements G in G, such that P conjugated by G is inside Q. There's a difference with the fusion category because here we are really picking the elements, not the conjugation maps. So two elements giving me the same conjugation, but here I count them as this thing. Okay, now that I have this set, I consider the orbits under the action of Q on it. So that's where the name orbit category comes from. Consider the orbit, of the action on the set of G such that P the G is Q. Now we need to find a nice collection of subgroups of G. And it turns out that a nice class is the class of P-centric subgroups of G. These are the P subgroups P of G 
such that the center of P is a syllable suburb of the centralizer in G. So just to figure it out what this means, imagine we take a silo S of G. This means that the centralizer in S of P must be contained P. Otherwise, we will have an extra P in the centralizer in G. So P contains uh, its centralizer in the silo of the silo, in the silo P sub that contains it. P is containing S, the centralizer in S of P is the center. Okay, and now you can define the centric or category. You just take the orbit category, but instead of focusing on all the subgroups, you only take the P-centric ones. And the morphic value is exactly the same. Why did we do all that? Because prior proved that if you make this choice on subgroups, what you get is a sharp homology decomposition. So this limit vanishes for a higher greater than one, and then you have a nice way to describe BG. So working with this sample subgroups was a good idea. Okay, so we know what fusion systems are. We know what sharpness means. Now let's put it all together. So now we want to extend these results that are about groups to the world of fusion systems. And the obvious way, so the only place where you see the group appearing is in this category here. So we want to replace this by a category depending on F, not on G. And also we need a class of subgroups. We cannot talk about P-centric subgroups of G. We need a class that we can define only using F and not the G. This is what we're gonna do now. F is a saturated fusion system on the P-class. First of all, uh, there is a notion of classifying space BF for X. So we use the same notation we for groups. And so all this makes sense. We can really extend all this reasoning to fusion systems. Now, how do we define the orbit category of a fusion system? Well, the objects are the subgroups of X so far. So good. as for morphism, this time we take the fusion maps from P to Q and we consider the orbits under the action of the inner of Just a note, if F is the fusion category of G, this is not exactly the orbit category of G. It's actually isomorphic up to quotient by some centralizer. Just to give you an idea, try to put P and Q equal one. So in here, if you put one and one, well, the homomorphism is just one, you have just had the identity, and then, well, we have orbit, you're not doing anything, so you get one. But if we go back to the other definition, now, if we have one, one, well, this is all G. All G is sending P at one to one. And then uh, we take the orbits under the action of one, and so you get all of G. So you get G here and one in the other one. Well, because if you take G, you portion by the centralizer in G of one, that's how you get the one. Okay, so they are not exactly the same, but they are related, just portion by the centralizer. G. Okay, so this is a nice extension of um, the concept of Kafka or Kafka. Now we need the, the class, the nice class of groups, of subgroups of X. So first of all, let me do a bit of notation. When P is a subgroup of S, uh, I write P to the F to denote the set of all subgroups of S fused to P. So basically, your subgroup Q in S for which I can find a fusion map that is an isomorphism in F from P to Q. And here, if F is uh, the fusion copy of the group, the fusion maps are conjugations. So this is really P to the G. Okay, that's why the notation. Here. Yeah. This is our class of groups, X centric subgroups of X. These are P subgroups P of S. Here I do not say P subgroups because S is a sinus. So of course, they are P subgroups such that the centralizer S of Q is containing Q whenever Q is fused to P. 
So this is the way to generalize the previous definition. Remember, that's why I mentioned before that saying that the center of P is a scene of the centralizing G of P, meant in particular that the centralizing S of P is contained. And we need to make sure that this works not just for P, but for all the subspheres. Okay, and now we can talk about centric orbit category the same way as for groups. The orbit category in which the subgroups are the F centric subgroups. So that's we are ready to extend wire steel. So wire sharpness theorem is up here. Now, as I said, we can extend it to fusion system, just replacing the orbit category, the centric orbit category G with the centric orbit category of F. And it's a conjecture to prove that actually what you get is a, a sharp homology decomposition. So that this limit is again zero whenever I is greater than one and for every J. And either to prove this conjecture or to describe it at least for some choices of fusion systems. This is was stated already as problem nine in the book Fusion Systems in Algebra Topology by Ash Parker, Kessel, and Oliver. It was published in 2009. But now, Diaz and Park did something more. They stated this conjecture in 2018. So let's read it together and then I'll point out what's the connection with the other. So let F be a saturated fusion system on final figure. So far, so let M be a Mackie factor over the full orbit category of F. Now, I don't have time here to tell you what the Mackie factor is, but it's given by a couple of factors, a variant, a controvariant one, from the full orbit category of F to the FP models. And for example, these two functors, the covariant and contravariant, they agree on subgroups. So M upper star of P is the same as M lower star of P. Then there are some conditions on the action of the morphism. And the most important rule is the so called making the composition form. So it must satisfy this formula. This is for another talk. And if you're interested about it, I'd be happy to put up references about Maki so the point is the conjecture says that if we have these tools, then the limit on the orbit, centric orbit category of F computed of this N upper star Mackie function restricted to that category, this is zero whenever I is greater than one. So what does it have to do with the conjecture in the blue box, uh, the one below for people here? See there are no colors. So uh, the point is that the cohomology factor is an example of a Mackie factor. So if you can prove Yeltsin and Park conjecture, you'll get the conjecture at the bottom for free. So Yeltsin and Park are extended dryer sharpness theory in two ways, from groups to fusion systems and from homology, homology factor to Mackie factor. Okay, so this is the sharpness conjecture for fusion system. And now I want to tell you a bit of what we know about this conjecture. Let's keep it up here. So we want this limit to be zero. So, so for every part we have to Now, in the same paper where they established the conjecture, Diaz and Park proved that if your fusion system is a fusion system of a group, then everything works fine. The conjecture works. Now, if you one, the homology factor instead of Mackie factor, but this is just to higher sum, basically. It works for groups. Most of the times when you have something that already works for groups, you can extend the techniques nicely to fusion category. And then they needed some extra work to make it work also for Mackie factors in general, but let's say this was not surprising, that if you start from a fusion category of the group, the conjecture is true, still false. So we are left with our friends, the exotic fusion systems. And this is the moment to remember my examples. <laughs> so I mentioned that there are exotic fusion systems constructed on P groups that have a maximum subgroup that is a P. Now, Diaz and Park built a machinery that uses the classification of Oliver to actually prove that in, also in this case, the homology decomposition, you get this shot. So the conjecture holds. And as I said, this is a big 
class of exotic fusion systems. So this is uh, this gives some hope that really the conjecture is true if you can already have it for this big class. And my contribution to the project is uh, about this other class I mentioned. I told you there are 27 exotic fusion systems on a Silo 7 suburb of G27. And actually, uh, together with Hector Marmo, we proved that the conjecture holds for all silo of this suburb of G2P whenever P is greater than than 5. Well, again, for the non exotic one, it's true by Parker. The answer is also really what uh, needed to be proved was for P plus 7 and the exotic. But in our approach that follows Yes and Park strategy, we could compute it for all silo without focusing specifically only on the prime seven and only on the exotic fusion system. We do it all at once. And as I said, we really follow uh, the strategy even by TNC. I should mention that earlier this year in January, on the ARCHIV, um, I put a paper by Anke Liedman and Lin where um, they can prove the conjecture that only for the homology factor, not for the Mackey factor. When F is Bunsen Solomon systems, the one for P by two, or the Parker Strauss systems, the last example I gave you before. And they did it in a completely different way. So they didn't use the strategy of DSM Park, they constructed new objects called puncture groups. And they somehow proved that when you have a fusion system affording a puncture group, then uh, the conjecture concerning the homology factor works. But still, the question is open if we want conjecture I stated here, so for math factors. Okay, I still have some time, so I want to tell you a bit about the strategy used to prove this conjecture because it's a strategy that you can apply to every fusion system in here. So the first point is to, instead of looking at all Mach factors, what you can actually work with are the simple factors. And it turns out that they are all nice in the sense that all simple Mach factors look like SQV, where Q is a sum of S and B is a symbol FP of the Q model. So for every couple of Q and B, you have exactly one simple Mach factor. And it has a very explicit description, so you can really read how it acts. For example, if you take a subgroup L of S that is fused to Q, so there is an isomorphism from L to Q, then this factor applied to L gives you exactly B. You can denote B alpha if you want to keep track of the isomorphism on fusion map. Or if you take any subgroup P of S, this is the definition of this simple Mackey factor. So you are taking a sum over the conjugates of Q containing P, and you take only one for each P conjugacy class, and you compute this relative trace from L to the normalizing P of L of the module E alpha. So again, this was just to tell you that Really, the action of this factor is explicit, it's very clear, and it enables you to deduce immediately some properties. For example, if P is a subgroup of S, and we know that when we apply the simple Mackey factor, we get, don't get zero, then it's possible to prove that P must contain a conjugate of Q, but this is obvious, otherwise the sum is zero. You don't have anything to sum up. But also, you can find at least one that is self centralizing in P. And roughly speaking, the reason is that otherwise you can split the trace from L to the centralizing Q of L times L. And in this splitting, you are killing it. So you get a zero. So, in order for this sum not to be zero, you can always find a sum of L in P conjugate to Q and that is L decentralized. Of this consequence, if P is abelian and you know that this factor of like P is not zero, then read here. This means you can find an L such that centralizer in P of L, but this is P. P is abelian, centralizes and sub. So you get P 
containing L, so P equal to L, so really the first part, this gives you that P is a conjugate of P. So whenever you have an abelian sum that is mapped not to zero by this simple Mackey factor, you automatically know that P must be fused to Q. Okay, and why do we care about simple Mackey factor? Because the Edison part gave us this sufficient condition. So if the condition in the box is satisfied, then we have sharpness. So this is really what we work with. Okay, we don't really work with the inverse limit. Our strategy involves improving what in is in the box. Because if you have that, then you have sharpness. And the idea is, for any choice of Q, P, and R subroots of S, where you want P and R to be F-centric, so remember, self-centralizing and all the few subgroups are self-centralizing, while Q and T, that is the intersection of P with R, are not F-centric. And for every choice of a module V, F, P, or Q module, then this composition of maps is zero. So you start from S, Q, V, simple method. Mackey factor of P, you restrict from P to T and you get a simple Mackey factor of T, and then you induce from T, so this should be an R, and you get SQBR. So if you can prove that this map is zero, this composition of maps is zero for every choice of Q, P, and R, then you're done. So that's your job. So that's the strategy. Pick your favorite saturated diffusion system and check if you can find subgroups Q, P, and R for which this composition is non zero. Because if you cannot find them, then you have the sharpness conjecture for your fusion system. And there are some easy observations one can do straightforward. So, first of all, using the fact that P and R are F centric and T is not, then T must be properly containing P, that must be properly containing in S, because this intersection of P with R. So, just using this information, the fact that they are F centric and T is not, you know, T is not a maximal sub of S. Similarly, you get immediately that the center of S must be contained in you know, T because center of S is in the centralizing S of P, that is in P because P is F centric. Similarly, it's in the centralizing in S of R, that is in R. So it is in the intersection of P and R, that's exactly T. So half a line of proof. So when you're looking for Q, P, and R and their intersection T, you know that this T must contain the sum of S, that is not a maximum sum of S. Of course, these three modules, S, Q, P, P, T, and R, are all non-zero. Otherwise, automatically, one of the maps is zero and then everything is zero. And now remember what I told you in the previous slide. If S, Q, P, P is zero, is non-zero, sorry. If P were a billion, P will be conjugated to Q, but P is, is eccentric, Q is not. So this cannot happen. So P and R are not a billion. So you immediately have restrictions on these subjects P and R and their intersection T. And there are more observations you can make in general. So it works for any fusion system. Want to work. And now, very last slide, that's two minutes, and tell you a bit about the future system we chose to study. So we chose the silo of G2P. This is a group of order P to the six that looks like in this picture. So it has maximal importance plus. So if we call gamma two of S the right side of S, and gamma I of S the other terms of the lower central series, it's like in the picture. Gamma two as index P square in S, and then you go down by P at each step. And serial actually coincides with the upper central series for S in the reversal. So gamma five is the center of S, gamma four is the second center of S, and so on. What about the maximal sums? We define gamma one to be the centralizer in S of gamma two over gamma four. This is the a maximal subgroup that sits nicely on top of the lower central sphere, that's why we use this notation. And in the scene of G2P, this group is extra special. Then we have another maximal subgroup characteristic, that is the centralizer of the second scene. 
And every other subgroup, it looks like M, is another P group of maximal importance. So not important for today. So what do we do? Remember, T is intersection of P. We got with R, T is not the same. The first step is to prove that T properly contains the center of S. And we can prove that it actually must be inside of this gamma. And here we use the information we have on the classification of fusion system in this group. This is where it's important to use the classification works, the one of Parker and Semerara in this case, to get information on essential subgroups for people to know what they're talking about. And this forces T to be inside of gamma. And now gamma one is extra special. It's the right subgroup is in the center of S. So the second assertion here is trivial now. T is no one like gamma one. The second thing to prove is that T does not contain the centralizer in S. Once we have that, we can prove T is not normal in S. And the reason is that the normal subgroups are the one you see in this picture. And most of them are self centralizing in S. So we are only left with center of S that we already got rid of in part one and the second center of S. And we can get rid of this because it's centralized by a maximal sum of S. So that's the key idea. So finally, we are left with T being inside gamma one, but it cannot be normal in S. So it's somewhere around here. And with a bit of work in trying to understand where P and R could be, if they are inside of gamma one or not, one can actually do that if that's not possible. So you cannot find this triple of subgroups P and R intersecting T that give me a composition of maps that is non zero. So the composition must be zero, so we have shunts. And the very last thing is I want to tell you is that we believe this is working progress that we can extend this approach to every P group of maximal hypothesis class, maybe with the extra assumption for now that gamma one is extra special. Because with these two assumptions, parts one and two still hold. So we already know that T must be inside gamma one of S and it's not self centralizing. We still have to work out about three or four, but we strongly believe that we can get sharpness in this case. And the Parker stock family would, and is included in this scenario. So we will have the conjecture for the Parker stock family, even for the Mackey factor, not just for the homology factor, as we recently have. Okay, so that's all I wanted to tell you. I think I'm right on time. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, are there any questions in the audience, the physical one first? I think there was a question on your four last slide. Yes, yes. Uh, gamma one of S, so S has order P to the P minus one. Uh, no, S has order P to the P minus one. Yeah. Uh, this gamma one of S has order P to the P minus two. So how can you, oh, extra special. Yeah, it has yeah. P to the odd. Okay. Yeah. yeah, for equal seven, so it's a seven to the six, it's a seven to the five. So it's a very low hypothetical class compared to S. Yes, yes, I mean, yes. So, well, in this case, it's especially it has class two. And, but also in general, for any P of a maximal hypothesis class, the class is low. One. You can always define it's gamma one of S and the class is low. It does not complain any no, no, that's not the thing, Sasa. <laughs> okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? There is. A... I have a yeah. question from online. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, I have a question. Can you go back a couple of slides? Uh, you were talking about uh, conjecture being satisfied uh, for uh, only for the homologies. It, um, back, no, the, the previous one, and this one. Uh, so the, the conjecture you said was satisfied for, uh, no, wait, maybe not this one. There, there was, uh, give me a second. Yes, you said that that, 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 that conjecture was satisfied uh, for Benson, Solomon, and Parker Strott. 
Yeah. Oh, yes, that one, yes. <laughs> Uh, is that working only for cohomology functor or for any Maki functor that is cohomological? No, I think they explicitly said the uh, cohomology functor. Now, I don't know if the work actually uh, can be applied in general. We should read carefully the paper, and really, it's hmm. very, very recent. But what they state in, as a consequence of the results is just for the cohomology functor. Okay, okay, thank you. But you can find it on the archive. That's have a look at it. Okay, let me take a screenshot and I will do that. <laughs> it's called puncture hips. It's a bit mysterious. If you type sharpest, you won't find it, but it's called puncture hips. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? So, in case you want to find Valentina next week in Milano, the conference for the young algebraists. Yes, yes. So, if you, if you decide to come, they are all welcome. Let me be here for a week. <laughs> and for us here, we can thank Valentina again. Right until uh, ten past two. Oh, 15 minutes.